myself and Mary Lynn are actually going to work together to talk a little bit about operating a medication assisted treatment program. Um, and initially I'd like to start off with talking about some myths of methadone um, and medication assisted treatment and Mary, Mary Lynn would like to talk about what we'd like to take away from this session. I just really wanted you to leave your your druthers at the door because I think it's really important that this group of people support medication assisted treatment. Everybody says, oh, I don't know, I got clean and sober without any of that stuff. And so there is not one fix for everybody. And if this group can't get on the same page, providers and DCF and everybody, that this is a treatment option and really a powerful one for people with opioid disorders, um, then, then the rest of the world isn't gonna follow suit. So I really want you to leave here today thinking this is a, an important option for people. Um, that's really where I wanted to start. So the first myth that I wanted to talk about was uh, this really isn't any different than heroin. You know, it's a substitute for, for a, a drug. It's a, one substitute for another. Um, and, and that really isn't true because as you heard the doctor talk about the half-life, um, somebody that's addicted to heroin or oxycodone actually spends... Um, every four to six hours looking for another dose. And people that are on medication assisted treatment, um, Suboxone, Subutex, or Methadone, end up having one um, medication every 24 to 36 hours. So you're able to work, you're able to do things that um, you weren't able to do if you were looking for your drug every four to six hours. So I think it's really important to see the difference. There is a huge difference in those. So I'd like to um, piggyback on what Mary Lynn said um, in regards to the difference. Methadone is highly regulated and it takes a very motivated individual to commit to the requirements to be on a medically managed treatment program like methadone. These individuals are going in daily for dosing and committing to those biopsychosocial um, treatments that are required to continue on those medications um, and treatment. I'd also like to talk about um, what we hear a lot, myths, is that you're replacing one drug with another. Actually, research um, supports that medications and biopsychosocial treatments actually assist an individual in recovering and help to sustain recovery. Thanks, Shannon. Um, so the next methadone, um, or the next myth that we wanted to talk about was that everybody's dying from methadone. And that is true, a lot of people do die from combinations of methadone or um, benzodiazepines. However, methadone in a clinic is not where they're dying. What they're doing is getting methadone and mixed with things on the street. They have no idea what they're taking. So when you look at the um, report from FDLE, it does say these people died from overdoses of methadone, et cetera. Um, in a clinic, it actually is um, ordered by a doctor, mixed by a pharmacist, dosed by a nurse. So they're safe. Um, they're safe and people do very well in methadone clinics or with other um, drugs. Um, I think that was all I had to say about that. Yeah, sure. I'd like to add in that is um, many people say addicts make a choice and in some cases Oftentimes there is a choice related to that. I would like to say though, 85% of all heroin users actually started off with using prescription drugs and many of them using them legitimately for some illness, pain management, motor vehicle accidents, chronic disease factors. Um, another myth is that methadone is, it, it, or the medication assisted treatment um, hinders or disrupts the recovery process. Actually, medication assisted treatment actually helps that individual engage in recovery by managing the withdrawal symptoms and allowing that individual to engage in treatment and get back to normalcy, be able to go back to work, be able to function on a functioning level where they can do normal daily activities rather than look for that next um, um, medication so that they can keep the withdrawals at bay. It also reduces the risky behavior associated with some of the complications with drug use and mortality. The other myth is medication assisted treatment is a short term option. Actually there's nothing that indicates that medication, discontinuing medication assisted treatment is beneficial. 
In fact, individuals who are using medication-assisted treatment for one to two years actually have the highest rates of recovery. Um, re recovery. Next. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about medically managed treatment programs and the difference in the two. So there are two options. There's a medication assisted treatment clinic as well as an OBOT clinic. Okay. Hey. Okay, so I'm going to talk about a MAT clinic, and um, more recently we've started actually giving Subutex out of our MAT clinic. Of course, it's always been methadone. But Subutex is an option now, especially for pregnant women or people who have a little more recovery collateral. Recovery collateral is, um, do you have a job? Have you been arrested? Um, have you, um, do you have a home to go to? Um, are you able to um, um, follow through with something day after day? So those that aren't able to do that probably need to at least start in a clinic that you have to come every day. Um, and the reason for that, have you been arrested before? Have you had an overdose before? Those, so we actually have a form that we've included um, on a back table somewhere um, that gives a summary of all those things we interview someone with as they uh, come into our, our programs. We want to decide which one is best for you. And uh, those without recovery collateral are really um, safer in a situation that they don't take a prescription home that they can sell or misuse, et cetera. So we don't start there. But if someone starts on Subutex in the program that they're coming every day to get, then they can be transitioned easily to an outpatient OBOC clinic. So let me let you talk about this. I also want to say that counseling is a major part of that. It's medication-assisted treatment. So um, the counseling piece is really core to the program. People do have psychosocial issues and need to be addressed to improve their recovery collateral. If they didn't have any coming in, they can have some when they leave. Um, and also, um, let me see, John. that's pretty much it. Your turn. <laughs> So the other option is a OBOT model, which is an office-based opiate treatment model, which utilizes buprenorphine or Suboxone. It provides an office-based option where the individual actually goes into the office, similar to what you go to your regular physician's office, and they can receive opiate replacement therapy um, combined with other biopsychosocial services that go along with that. This option actually is a little less restrictive and would be appropriate for individuals who have some of those um, recovery collateral support systems, um, stable housing, family support, um, you know, transportation, um, some of those key components. Um, it actually does, and it doesn't require the daily dosing at the clinic. The most important component of that is that it is essential that these services, regardless of what platform you're receiving medication-assisted treatment, that it's combined with the biopsychosocial um, components to ensure that we're addressing that part of the disease. Thanks, Shannon. So I want to talk a little bit about the Yale model. And um, several people have been part of the NITEX, so several programs across the state have been part of the NITEX training about the Yale model. Uh, thanks to Florida Behavioral Health Association, they offered this to us, and I think PAR, um, someone in Ocala, um, several people have been part of this uh, training. So uh, what's different about it? Well, we were having everybody come in. Does anybody have an OBOT clinic? If you have an OBOT clinic, raise your hand. Raise your hand, great. Okay. Anybody want an OBOT clinic? Anybody? Okay. So. What happens in the Yale model is that rather than everybody coming in to see the doctor, since your doctor's time in our field is so limited and we have uh, so few of them, and um, so we want to limit the amount of time they have to spend with the doctor. So when the first appointment happens, you do the screening and they see the biopsychosocial staff member and then they see the doctor, they put them on the medication and then they leave. And the next appointment is set up with the licensed social worker or the licensed um, uh, mental health counselor. So they come back in and do all that work with them so they can have their session. And then the doctor steps in and the social worker gives a rundown of how it's been going for them so that most of the time is spent with the social worker. 
and then the medication is written by the doctor. He asks the questions he needs to ask or she needs to ask, and then um, they write the script and they leave it and they go into the next room. So it's really more efficient than having them all come in like an outpatient doctor appointment and see the doctor for 30 or 45 minutes where they end up doing the counseling. So I wanted to sort of share that with y'all. It's been really a learning experience. By using this interdisciplinary model um, of services, we're able to enhance the treatment and maximize our physician time, which actually improves the, our ability to provide the services to the individual and meet their recovery needs. Let's talk about the two different opiate replacement medications, um, starting off with methadone. Um, so as the doctor um, said, the methadone is a full agonist with a long half-life of 24 to 30 hour, 36 hours. There is no ceiling effect, meaning that with the increased doses, the effect on the individual is, it, the, it affects the individual. Um, it is dosed every day at the clinic by a nurse. And these individuals have generally lower recovery collaterals. Um, buprenorphine, which can be utilized in the office-based opiate treatment model, as well as in the MAT clinic model. It's a partial agonist. It has a long half-life. There is a ceiling effect, as the doctor was talking about, which means after about a certain milligrams, the effects plateau with the individual. It can be prescribed in an office-based opiate treatment model, and it can also be used in a MAT clinic model if that individual needs additional support, especially in that um, induction phase. And then they can transition to a lower level of care, like an office-based service. <laughs> Thanks, Shannon. Um, I wanted to mention the prescribing regulations about this only because um, the managing entities, I don't think, were familiar with that when they um, had to put this out quickly. Um, the first year that someone is doing this, they only have 30 people they can actually work with. So if you have a doctor that's in your area that is um, maybe a consultant or is actively participating 20 hours a week, but they have a private practice somewhere else, those 30 people are limited to both of those locations by that doctor. So it's really important for you to make sure that you know how many other people they're seeing because we don't want to get caught um, having that physician work for us and prescribe 30 and doing 30 over there in his private practice or with another organization. Um, the second year you can sign up for, I think it's 100 people, and the third year it's like 230, 275 now. So I think that's really important to keep track of. Um, you have to do that at your location for sure, and you have to know what the doctor's doing at their other locations. So. Yeah, I, I sort of mentioned the recovery collateral before, and I don't know that I need to go over that again because we're trying to limit our time. So, so I think we want to um, end here with that both medications are equally efficacious, and it's completely dependent upon what the physician and the individual um, finds most beneficial to that individual's recovery. The other part that I want to touch on is that each medically managed treatment option are regulated differently, they're licensed differently, there's different reporting platforms, and there's different funding for each one of them. Okay, I think it's Darren's turn. Here's the microphone. Take it away. Got it? Actually, if you don't mind, I'll stand up here. I prefer to stand anyway. Just let me grab my notes real quick. The uh, Florida Alcohol and Drug Abuse Association is the administrative services organization for the uh, injectable extended release naltrexone version. However, when we get prospective clients or patients that call us on the phone, we discuss all three MAT options because it's a matter of matching the person's circumstance and the level of functionality with the best medication. So those of us that, you know, sometimes we get accused that, oh, you're just an extension of Alchemies and you're just pushing this medication. I want to be the first to tell you, no, we, we give them all three options. We go through their history, whether they've actually gone through a methadone program, how they handled or tolerated the medication, uh, buprenorphine, the same thing, before we get into the explanation of naltrexone. 
The state funds, we have two different programs that we operate. We have one through the Office of State Courts Administrator, which primarily targets those involved with the courts or criminal justice system and those folks that are coming out of jail or prison. And it also includes those folks that are at risk for involvement with the courts and criminal justice. That program is $7.5 million this fiscal year. $7 million of that is direct service funding. And our DCF program has $6.3 million, uh, $6 million of which is used for direct services. We are still accepting some applications in both programs. We have some geographic areas that are underserved, and we would like to beef those up. Uh, we are starting to get near the ceiling as far as how allocating the full amounts of money, though, so I'll just be honest with you. If you are interested, uh, especially if you're in the areas of Broward County, Palm Beach County, or Manatee County, where the problem is particularly acute and we don't quite have sufficient service, please, by all means, apply. You can go to www.fadaa.org, and there's a big orange Vivitrol button that you can click on, and it'll take you into the application process. Right now, we have 52 providers participating at the end of, as of the end of this month in the state courts program. And by the end of January, we'll have 42 in the DCF program. We pretty much have pretty good geographic coverage, all but about a half dozen counties, which are significantly rural. There are the options to go to one of our enrolled providers. However, it's a tremendous travel issue uh, that plays. Um, Dr. Stavros, as Mark mentioned, we have peer mentors in both programs. We have four physicians in each program that are designated to provide technical assistance to uh, doctors, medical directors, and medical staff, and clinical staff that have questions about Vivitrol side effects and the efficacy of the medication. So we have those contacts. They're actually in your packet. I think on the second or third page, there's a chart. And so what we're going to do is we have, I mentioned we had 52 providers in one program, 42 in the other. We still have about a dozen in each program that haven't started actively serve patients yet. So we'll be proactive this coming month and have our physicians contact those of you that have not yet started to kind of figure out where the holdup is. The medication is given uh, typically on a schedule intramuscular injection every 28 to 30 days. You can go as early as 21 days if your cravings hit earlier than the 28 day schedule. And you can go as late as the 35 day to kind of keep a steady state in your system and keep you protected. We try to target individuals that want to be drug free and that are motivated to at least follow through on the medical assessment and the lab work that is required before you begin the protocol. It's better to, what we've found is it's better not to screen them right when they come in the door and everything's hitting them and they're still very, they're coming down off of their illicit drug use. So what we ask is once you've established rapport with them in an outpatient or residential setting, that's the time to screen them for the potential use of Vivitrol. And we found that we have a much better uh, follow through rate because they've already established some clean time so they're not having to go through a detox period, as Walter alluded to, seven to 10 days for opioids, three to five days for alcohol. So that's another advantage. If you operate in jail or in prison programs, typically what they're doing is they're targeting to give one or two shots before the person is released to the community. That way, that 90 to 120 day period that follows that is the most crucial for recidivism and relapse you've got kind of an insurance policy. You've got a steady state of medication in there occupying those receptors and getting in the way of any drug use. To kind of just give you a little background on some of the stats, we've operated the OSCA program, the state courts program, since February of 2015, and the DCF program since November of 2015. And just to kind of give you a sense of the volume that we've taken care of, We've screened over 6,408 individuals for the programs. These are combined figures, by the way. Uh, 4,152 have gone on to receive the medical assessment and done their lab work in prep for the uh, protocol. That's a 65% follow-through rate. That's something that we're eagerly targeting to bring that number up. Uh, of those 4,000 folks, 3,155 have received one or more injections which is a follow-through rate of 76%. Uh, 
Uh, total, we've given out 10,199 injections in the last two and a half years. 85%, as Walter's statistics showed you, 85% of those are white. A little over half of them are male. 12 to 15% throughout the state are Hispanic, of course, with higher concentrations in Central and South Florida. The average age of our patients in both programs is 40. Opioids are a combination of alcohol and opioids because we do actually allow the treatment of alcohol dependence with this medication. 65% of the OSCA patients that present either have an opioid disorder or a combination of alcohol and opioids. The DCF program started out initially with a very heavy alcohol use disorder count and it has since risen to 53% of them now that are either opioids or a combination thereof. Uh, the program is currently active in 10 jails and we think we'll be up to 12 jails by the end of March. And one last note to leave you with, three quarters of the folks, we, we kind of struggled with how do you demonstrate to the Florida legislature because this is a significant amount of money. The courts program is not funded by the STR grant, it's state dollars and half of the, a little over half of the DCF program is funded by the STR grant, so you still have some state dollars in there also. So what we've come up with is, what does the medication do as opposed to what the treatment outcome should be traditionally? And that is the medication needs to stabilize and improve your functionality and the likelihood that you'll follow through on your outpatient or residential treatment. So I'm happy to report that three quarters of our patients in both programs if either successfully completed the MAT protocol or if they made substantial progress and at least completed or were still active in their psychosocial treatment, outpatient or residential, or at the time of their last injection they had eliminated any uh, urge to use or cravings. So that improved the likelihood that they're more stable, they'll be more likely to do well within their families, they'll be more likely to hold down, get and hold down a job. 70% uh, of our clientele does not have a job when they come in, and the figures are similar when they go out. So that's all I have for you. Okay, um, now it's your turn. Um, one, let me clarify one thing. When Darren says we, he means you. Um, because you're running the um, uh, naltrexone program, we're administering it. So those 50 providers are all represented in this room. You're the ones that are seeing those patients and identifying those patients and, and moving those patients. Um, and we're, we're administering that. Um, and we um, have been very pleased doing that. And we think that uh, it's a very good program that has um, uh, 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 helped a lot of people. So we, we have folk here that understand the medications, folk here that understand the brain. The, so what questions, what thoughts? Well, I mentioned before education is going to be huge, you know, and we talk about thinking outside of the box and Mark talked about going out to the ERs. You know, the ER is just such a, an unbelievable place to start this. And so the paper that we're going to be presenting is actually teaching them how to start treatment. So in an ER setting, traditionally what we do is basically like, okay, you have an uh, addiction problem or you had an overdose, you know what, you should probably get some help. Here's a list of some places you can go. What are the chances those people are going to go? Really low, okay? So, but what if I did this? What if I said, you know what, and, and I'll tell you, this is just a huge thing. I, I might be going a little bit tangential, so, but, um, you know, again, when an addict comes into my ER, they're not there for treatment. They're there to score, right? So that's what they're trying to do, basically. But if I approach them differently and just say, listen, let's address the problem that actually is at hand. And so having that education of being able to maybe approach the patient differently, let's do a screening on, and saying there actually might be an opioid use disorder, as opposed to saying, yeah, you're not going to get any drugs from me today. Go away. Let's, let's address it as a problem and let's see what other options we might have. You know what? The reception from the patient is completely different in my experience. They're like, wow, this is a totally different you know, <laughs> experience than I've ever had before and they're a little bit apt to listen. At that point, now we start engaging about talking about treatment, right? So not just say, hey, go get some 
help somewhere, but let's talk about what we can do to start treatment as well. Maybe we start doing an induction on buprenorphine there. Maybe we start talking to them about what the options are, naltrexone out there if they were able to get off. But, you know, and then also having those established relationships with providers outside. So maybe at opioid treatment uh, providers, maybe OTPs, or maybe know what the local OBOTs are and start gaining those relationships where now we have a flow of patients, we know exactly where to send those patients as well. Is there a lack of OBOT? Oh yeah, I mean in my area, I wish I could send people. I have patients, I'm like, where am I gonna send them? You know, So uh, we need to get the word out, understanding that uh, people need to get their data 2,000 waivers. I'm gonna encourage all my ER physicians, just get the waiver, it's easy. Eight hours education, you got the waiver, and now you can have at least 30 patients. And this, you know, we can make this happen. And so I think education is going to help. Thanks. Hang on just a second. That's a really good question, John. Um, one of the things that, that we have done about that is we actually, the nurse practitioners and um, PAs can now provide um, education and treatment in these facilities in the outpatient uh, buprenorphine treatment uh, clinics as well as methadone clinics. The process of getting permission through DCF has to occur. Um, the training has to occur. The, I've done the training, it's 24 hours online, it took forever. Um, <laughs> but I feel more educated about what we're running at DACA because I did that. So even if you aren't going to provide it, which I'm not today, um, doing that training was really worthwhile. Um, uh, and their, their tests after each section and lots of lectures and everything. So I think that's one option. Another option is twice as many people signed up to be psychiatrists at USF this year than they've ever had before because people are interested in, in getting into this field now because there's actually medications available to treat it. Um, so that's really exciting. Of course, it'll take them four years to get through, but uh, there's hope. Um, so those are sort of, sort of some of the answers I have for um, treatment and partnering with the university that, can, that you can provide the resources for them to gain education in this area. The VA is not the end-all, be-all, do-all of treatment for or education for the medical school. It really is important they see what we do in our areas. So we've partnered with USF and they send residents every month and a fellow every year to come and get that education so that they know what we're doing and it's not just VA treatment. So that's really helpful. Um, somebody like him is available to you. Um, and there's seven other doctors that are available to you. It's in the list, it's in the packet through this program that Darren uh, is administering. Um, those doctors are available for a phone consultation, an on-site consultation. We have sent physicians before down from, from um, one program like Orlando to a certain part of the state and they've sat and spent the day with the doctor and with those nurses um, to talk through that reality and those myths and I think it would be hard pressed to sit through what, what Dr. Starbert has just sat, just presented, and not start changing your thinking that, whoa, maybe there is something here um, to the science of medical management of somebody with an opioid use disorder. That's a great question, and definitely that we do see that in, in the um, in, in the treatment component. I think again, it goes along with education, education and exposure, and working alongside of some of those providers that are actually utilizing the medication-assisted treatment, all three uh, modalities of treatment, um, having conversations and engaging them in the disease of addiction and what that looks like. Yes, it is a chronic progressive disease. It is also a behavioral component, which is why it's a combined com it's a combined therapy of medication as well as the biopsychosocial um, treatment options. Um, it's not one or the other, it's both. And um, it, it's, it's so, so important to continue to help them along um, because it is a culture change. It's, it's a tremendous culture change. Yeah, and that, that culture change took us about three years especially when we started doing um, Subutex or Methadone or Vivitrol in the residential program. Um, people, in the first three days or so, people are dozing off. 
Um, we don't want them in our program if they're going to be doing this, you know. So it was a real culture change, and, and I think that you just have to be patient with it. We brought in a lot of training. Um, the drug manufacturers have doctors come and talk, and all those kind of things can really help the staff get on board. So one of the things we're going to finish with today is uh, a summary of some of the suggestions that are being made. eBay, um, uh, eBay wave your hand is taking notes and so some of these things that, that surface will will be uh, will be um, brought back as part of what we DCF in in uh, our role is we want to know what we can do to help you all to get that 50% rate down so that you can retain people in treatment you can get them in you can retain them and it can make this thing work um, so one of the things I would say to you is bring him or some other doctor in, set up a workshop, invite all your staff, bring the other programs that are local, let's, we'll, we'll host that with you, and, let, and let's do that kind of work with the clinical staff. Um, bring people like Mary, bring people in that, that have an option to explain that culture change, um, because it, it's very significant. You know, there's two things that happen on this, on this program um, when we got the federal money. Infrastructure, putting the infrastructure in place, when you start talking about having to find a doctor that has to have this training, that only can do 30 patients the first year, that can, that's tough infrastructure. And, and I've been watching providers trying to adjust and figure out how to put that infrastructure in place. But then the second thing, and probably the biggest thing, has been culture. There's a huge culture shift taking place. I've talked to some people and they're so frustrated. They're like, well, this industry, and I'm like, hey, wait a second. This industry is making one of the biggest cultural shifts it has made that I've seen it make in 40 years. You have this shift to, to the understanding of the medication and the role of the medication. You have the, the understanding of the role recovery support plays and, and the role of people in recovery. I mean, we're making tremendous shift, and I think it's unfair to point fingers at the industry when people are working really hard to pivot. And, and, and my challenge is, if you're not pivoting, you maybe need to be looking for a different line of work because this right now is pivot. You have to pivot and do this very different than you have in the past. Well, I can give you one example. I was in Palm Beach last week, and um, the, um, uh, what's it called, Justin? Or the Regional Health Authority, or the, uh, the Medical Authority for that region. Uh, pardon? The Health Healthcare District has jumped in very differently around this issue, and have taken a lead, and they've spent the whole year training all their docs and their medical people about uh, about addiction, about medications, and they're now taking a leadership role in the whole Palm Beach space about this issue. So some of it, I think, is the same thing. How do we get FQHCs for the past five years have had funding and, and have been um, part of their requirement is to provide substance use disorder services, um, but you just haven't seen that penetration that um, that needs to take place. And, and probably one of the things uh, eBay put on the list is let's get with the FQHC Association yeah, and let's get with the Health Department Association, the Health Association. Those are good strategies. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm somewhat ambivalent about that because I do think addiction or substance use disorders is a specialty, not unlike orthopedics or something else. And I think, you know, if you have FQHC is starting to get trained and provide um, Suboxone, Subutex um, in the community that um, the counseling will go by the wayside. They, it's gotta be it's, there's got to be a connection and that they shouldn't just be given the medication and I think that's exactly what they'll do. So I'm a little ambivalent about that happening and I also wanted to say, remember the co-occurring change we made 15 years ago where we started treating co-occurring in our addiction, substance abuse, treatment. Um, it was a huge change for our counselors and they had to get on board with that. So this is not unlike that. It just takes the same amount of time. I think that's a good, a really good and important issue. 
Um, every one of these, all three of these medications say medication plus counseling. That's, that's in the protocol for the medication. And dose and go is, is, a, is a concern. Um, and um, I know DCF is looking at that issue. They're rewriting the rule as we speak. And, and I was reading this morning at 5.30 that, that proposed rule and the requirement for the counseling and so on and so forth. Um, I, does anybody want to does DC does anybody want to talk about that? It's just it's a it's it, it's a it's a very real issue that needs to be dealt with um, in the context of if we really want to inform the public in the medical community and people in recovery, then it all has to fit together in a context. I, I feel very strongly that DCF needs some guidelines in, in their uh, licensing protocol that says that that won't happen, that dose and go won't happen. And so they need to get into the licensing component how they look at um, what does that counseling component look like? Is it really a treatment plan other than just surface stuff? Uh, can somebody just drop in? Was there a counseling note that said they actually had a conversation about several things on that treatment plan? I think that's going to be the answer because many of us are doing those kind of quality programs and some people aren't. And so I think it's really key that, that we get into the licensing of that. One more question. So I, I think we approach this as any other chronic progressive disease. If we are talking about diabetes, we have um, diet and exercise and, and life changes. Some individuals need oral medication, others need insulin, um, but it's not something that we move them off from. We educate them, we teach them, we continue to treat the disease, and of course, each person requires a different level of treatment. It's not a cookie cutter um, process. You have to I, individualize those treatment um, options. So when you look at it as a chronic progressive disease, that's gonna look a lot different for different people. So some may need continued medication assisted treatment. Some may need a slow taper with some IOP services or, I, or, or residential services. Some may be able to utilize medication assisted treatment, taper off and then continue in outpatient services. So I think if you look at it as a chronic progressive disease and you approach it like like that, you understand that there's always going to be ongoing treatment of sorts with an individual with um, substance use disorder. So that's part of that treatment planning and the aftercare component of what that specific individual needs. Um, just again, like any other chronic disease, you form that treatment plan based on that individual's needs, and that includes those biopsychosocial components of that, the family support, the housing, access to services. Um, some individuals may need to come twice a week. Some may only need to come once a month. Um, it's very specific to the individual. So part of, part of the answer to that also is, um, <laughs> at some point you may finish your psychosocial, you may be in a stabilized environment, you may be totally functional and still feel like you need the medication, and and then I would say at that point, you, that's not dose and go. That's managing a, a medication on for somebody on a chronic condition, just like you would do on a diabetes medication or other medications. Um, so I, again, as Shannon's saying, that's very very patient specific. 